Sorry? Come in number four. <laughs> That's it, I know. Hey, I wonder if this will work. Oh, oh. Okay, when am I starting? So we're all going to be up there. Come on, man. Come on, Di, I think we're on. No, we're not. Though. Aren't we? Well, the man's giving us the thumbs up. Look, we're on. Start. Mask off? No, mask on. Start. Hello. Uh, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name's Justin. With me, I have Heather and Di, and we are going to imbibe in a little bit of uh, light through holes, basically, pinhole photography. Um, yeah, and they put me on first, which is quite a laugh, so there we go. Um, this is mainly about my own stuff, which is quite fun. Uh, whether it works or not, who knows, but uh, I've been doing pinhole photography for far too long, and uh, I quite like it, to say the least, so we'll just start off. Um, I went and did a degree in fine art photography in Derby, um, up in the UK. I come from Bristol, but my degree was in Derby. Very fine art, very John Blakemore, Ansel Adams stuff. And I didn't do any pinhole photography, but I did do a dissertation on the history and influences of astronomical photography, which is where this slide comes in. I was trying to capture images of the Earth moving. So think of a solar graph camera, but you put it on, the, on a clock that rotates once around the, once 360 degrees in 24 hours. So it tracks the stars. And I was trying to get a picture of the Earth moving. Why? I don't know. And it took me five hours on the roof of a multi-story car park in Derby to get pictures like this. And it was just basically, I still think it's the only photos ever taken of the Earth moving, which is actually what's happening. Every solar graph picture is a lie. It's a very beautiful lie, but it isn't how it is. We're not the centre of the known universe, but it's just one of those sort of astronomical things that links in with pinhole photography in loads of ways. And I find that, you know, through all these different types of pinhole that we're going to chat about today, um, the science, the astronomy, the chemistry, the physics, the history, the recycling, the whole bits and pieces of that just comes back in and gets churned around in your head in a beautiful way. So here we go. Um, Aristotle, he was really fab and fantastic. It actually goes back before him to Moti in China, 400 BC. A um, bit more on the history and stuff. But basically, Aristotle realized that like an image of the sun through a square hole would end up round. And here's a picture of my kids projecting a, an eclipse through the holes in a cream cracker, as you do, uh, uh, imitating Aristotle. Now, uh, uh, he was basically to do with obscurers, and one thing that people, I suppose, don't really realise is the hole was the only way you could experiment with light before lenses happened. You couldn't make clear glass till about 1500, till they put samphire in with the uh, sand and stuff. Before that, they were sort of relying upon a hole, but you could still create obscurers and camera obscurers like we've got in Bristol here, and I got carried away with making them myself. This is one in the... Uh, a primary school, uh, just projecting inverted images. This is a, a festival in Bristol where you go in through the fireplace and there's inverted images. And this is a TV where it's actually a fake TV and the lead doesn't go anywhere, but it projects the outside world on the big screen of a TV. And I call it the fastest live TV in the universe. And we've got a bit of video that almost certainly won't work. Let's see. No sound. Never mind. I'll guide you through it. Basically, this is a science fair. And this is basically freaking out a couple of kids. So just getting them to sort of like see the inverted image which is projected on television, which I dredged out of the river. And these are my eye skewers in the background. Then you sort of have also got an, a, a uh, handheld sort of uh, thing for changing channels, which doesn't work, which is also funny. Anything that disappoints people can't be bad. Um, so camera obscurers, they're just great fun. The thing about them is they're live. Okay, so the sound is going to work, but not very well. Never mind. Here's another one. Let's see if this happens. This is from WOMAD. Australian Mission Control.
So it's fun. It's a laugh. It's all sort of movement and stuff, which still photography isn't. So there's a lot of performance involved with it. But the wonder of camera obscures has been is always there and always will be. Um, I skewer is the most COVID unfriendly things in the world. Uh, they were here last year, but never mind. Uh, this is I'm going to go past that one, but I'm going to include this one because it's a laugh. It makes me proud to be British sometimes, I'll tell you. Um, this is the camera obscure, making room obscure. This was for Pinhole Day last year when Eric Renner, about two days, three days after Eric Renner had died. So um, I just put his book beside me while me and my wife did a, it was my birthday. So um, did a camera obscure image for him. Movement and time. This is back to sort of like still with image Pinhole. Um, I'm not going to go on about how I got involved with it and stuff. It's all through teaching and through sort of like just something that fitted me at the time, pinhole. But this is the metallic balloons moving around, five-second exposure, just creating a sort of amoeba. And more movement, walking through the Palace of Mirrors, the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles, just walking straight through this crowd, about 60 or 70 people with their DSLRs, and just, just allowing time and movement to happen. It's far more of a story, far more poetic. Oh. This is 47 second exposure taken during the last note of A Day in the Life by Sergeant Pepper. So you put the camera on my copy of Sergeant Pepper and it goes round for 47 seconds, which is the duration of the last note. Um, hopefully that won't carry on throughout the rest of the PowerPoint. Sometimes it does, we'll see. This is a sticking it onto a boomerang hurling boomerangs. It was before solography. It was just sort of like seeing how the indestructibility, which is what matters, I think, with pinhole. I love that. And not having a viewfinder, sticking it onto bicycles, cycling from one pub to the other. Um, this is, I like some, it's called being a, being a shuttlecock. And it's playing badminton with a pinhole camera from one side of a sports hall to another. Um, and it gives a picture as it would be seen if you were being a shuttlecock. You can do this with a DSLR once. There you go. Then we have solography, solarography, as I've called it here. Um, yeah, don't get the spelling wrong. Uh, yeah, but several people started doing it. But originally, it was done a long time ago by Paolo Gioli. Uh, or was it Dominic Strubon? Oh, I've forgotten. Sorry, long walk. But um, I started putting them out in Bristol about 15 years ago and harvesting them, and it was just great fun. I sort of like got into it through Tarja, Tarja Trig in uh, Finland and stuff and uh, just started playing. This is sticking it onto a gravestone. And it's odd because like, I was actually sort of keeping the grave from bramble and stuff for three months. Um, there's a lot to be said. Solar graphs, everyone needs to do solar graphs and stuff. More recently, I've been putting them on moving objects like tall ships and stuff. Um, so they put them on tall ships and then go across the Atlantic and stuff. These are people sort of like, we haven't got any motors on the ships at all, so they don't know where they're going to end up. <laughs> it's quite hopeless when it comes to pinhole photography, but quite fun when it comes to the whole ethos. Um, Biko Kikuchi. Uh, beer can cameras, what I started pinhole with. They're wonderful. They're really versatile. Um, can't use beer cans anymore, so there's weird organizations that can water around the place, and somehow that's better. Oh well. Um, here's a very, these are all 25, 30 years old. This is the eighth army attacking toothpaste. Um, this was actually in Barcelona last year. I saw this advert on the right for buy a new iPhone because your iPhone 10 is rubbish. So get an iPhone 11, you know, built in obsolescence rubbish. And if I had a lawyer, I could have made some money, but I haven't got one. So it's rather a shame. The photo is 30 years ago, mine, but um, nah, who knows? And this is underwater, getting a pinhole camera, beer can camera, filling it full of water, and then putting it underwater. So you've got the same refractive index inside and outside the camera. And this was done a few weeks ago, actually, at Falmouth Uni, where I teach. Uh, I use biology clamps quite a bit because they can hold a beer can camera at any angle, and that really adds to it. So you can start directing it away from having the sky in. When the sky goes into beer can cameras, it reflects the light quite a bit. You don't get the contrast. Whereas if you can hold it at any angle pointing downwards, you can start controlling it all. Um, and I just love using them. Uh, Lake or Cabbie. I come from Bristol. Bristol is where Humphrey Davy and Thomas Wedgwood invented photography in 1803. Just sort of get that one in. And then Fox Talbot sort of did a similar thing about 40 miles away. And Herschel came from Bath. So basically, we're just all seeped in it all. The orphelogram, everyone hates these, which is good. And it's just basically holding a pinhole camera really close to somebody and then blinding them with really intense flash guns for a few seconds. 
um, and making them look like hamsters, which is okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it, the reason I did it was because it shuts it down with rain in the UK, and I wanted to find a way of doing pinhole, which was reliant upon flash, and you have to get really close up. So there we go, and it makes people look horrible or beautiful. I think they look beautiful. People are beautiful. And uh, there we go. That's somebody's tongue, looking like a ragworm. <laughs> Yum. And there's me. So, and I do do, do, do you spray paint them in Bristol. If you're not, if, if you get arrested, if you haven't got a can of spray paint on you, yeah. If you, they, the police stop you, if you haven't got one, they arrest you. If you're spraying stuff, then you're okay. And this is putting pictures up any old wear in the uh, subways and stuff, awful grand pictures and stuff. They get graffitied, but who cares? They last a while. Tube pictures, 720 degree stuff. This is self-portrait of eating corn done with a toilet roll. I'd like to do video like this. Um, what's her name? Blooming Bjork went and ripped me off. Never mind. Give me an iPhone. Nah, don't bother. This is uh, the college green and a skateboard and my bicycle wheel. At the bottom, you see that line from left to right is the rim of my bike. And you can see the shadow of it. So it's a, free, it's a two 360-degree images, 720 degrees. I did a load of the Bristol Cathedral like this. I had about 15 cameras. It's going to be called in God Created Light. And uh, unfortunately, I went for a cup of tea, came back, and a bomb squad were there who weren't very happy. I can't imagine why not. I obviously don't like photography. This is uh, the next useful. This is going to take over from today. Painting is dead. Is basically the wheelie bin camera, where you just fill it full of big bit of paper. This was done with at the St Paul's Learning Centre, uh, ten minute exposure. And what, one thing I love about them, apart from their one offs like paintings, is you can also hold a camera, hold a phone up um, to the big giant negatives and see things in positives, which make kids, makes kids sort of enjoy their phones and enjoy the picture, I suppose. And this is uh, from some uh, just making stupidly sized cameras that you, know, you park illegally, park vans illegally in Trafalgar Square, and it's all daft. Nelson's column, the BBC have got that one. Boo. Uh, this was recent. This is my COVID cam. And this was doing colour photos with my COVID cam. Um, and here we go. Here's the first ever COVID cam picture. And we are. Not sure what else to photograph, really. Um, you know, but there we go. And this is a stereo picture. Um, again, completely pointless camera, but I quite liked it because you can't see anything. And uh, yeah, one of those ideas that you actually put into practice and then, you know, it doesn't matter if it's stupid or not, it's too late. You know, people can't ridicule you because it's too late. Bad luck. Tetra, tetra packs. Now, this is something I've been chatting with my son about is the fact I've got some stupid company that are selling water in tetra packs and they want me to sort of like do something. I mean, I hate transportation of water in containers. It's just pants, but there we go. So I'll probably say bog off. But this is using a one-day picture and putting leaf, leaf skeletons and stuff inside the pinhole camera rather than on outside. So you're doing a silhouette of a leaf. And I quite like playing with that. So objects inside cameras, because the depth of field works of pinhole cameras inside and out. Colour stuff, um, this is adapting. Have a look on my website, pinholephotography.org, but there's ways of using old manual cameras to make colour, and uh, you can also, and anyway, there's early colour stuff, that's the Royal Crescent in Bath, uh, Bath's really lovely and beautiful, so we hate it, because it's really close to us, and Bristol looks an absolute slum, but we love it. This is a capercaillie, why the capercaillie is on the verge of extinction, it's because of its smoking habit, um, but this was uh, taking over the stuffed animal collection of Bristol Museum. I do a lot of workshops with kids and difficult situations and stuff and you know we do pinhole photography and we come up with loads of play ideas and stuff. World Trade Center, I put, did an exhibition at Soho Photo and uh, I, I showed this photo to one of the guys putting the pictures up and he was one of the firemen who managed to get out and he said no show the picture and so I do. And the World Trade Center was an amazing space. I had a friend in Pattery Park who let us have a flat for a while and stuff. And, um, you know, the space was incredible. Here's the sculpture at the bottom looking straight up. Um, this is me looking lovely. And that's not me looking lovely. This is using flash, pinhole with flash. People don't do it, but you can. You don't have to worry about tripods and stuff. There's my feet. I like my feet. I'm very attached to my feet. And there's a duck who doesn't like my feet. And there's uh, looking through a wheat crunchy, wasted on everybody here, because nobody knows what a wheat crunchy is. They're great, so sort of crisp. And then somebody saw, I realized one day that these little cameras can actually sort of um, 
yeah, fit inside my mouth. So I took loads of photos from inside my mouth and ended up getting published in this book called Mouthpiece, which is so pointless, it's wonderful. Um, this is having a bath. Very well cropped. I say. Very difficult as well. This is the Lincoln Memorial. There it is. And then there's brushing my teeth with a dead spider. I like that one. You can see the hairs, look. They're lovely. There's Bert. A safety pin for his nose. There's Louis. Hello. Um, yeah, what do you photograph from inside your mouth? Well, this sort of stuff, obviously. My dentist attack me with a pair of pliers. And so it goes on. Biting my nails. I used to grow my nail really long for no reason at all. People were sort of covered in tattoos with bolts through their neck. Used to freak out because I had a long nail. Um, quite weird. And I also am very proud that one of my mouth photos uh, one was fifth place in the Potato Photographer of the Year last year, which was a lockdown thing for a charity of food, food stuff. Uh, thank you. F fifth place. I won a little piece of paper that said, you won fifth place. I was very proud of that. Um, oh, I'm going to, hopefully this will work. This is the best pinhole video ever done, okay? There's not many. This is the best. Might work. Come on, Katie, come on. Good. So there we are, the best pinhole video ever. They're very difficult, and uh, people don't like me using their really expensive cameras for using it. Um, pinhole day I've been involved with since the, it started. Unfortunately, this year my pinhole photos didn't come out, so it's the first year we haven't, I haven't been able to submit a picture. It happens every year. Please get involved with it. We need new people because we're all incredibly old. But it's the last Sunday in April. Please be part of it. It's just a way of promoting the wonder of pinhole. I'm currently a director of the Real Photography Company, which is a community darkroom in Bristol. And we basically do workshops for people and kids and anybody will have us, really. Um, it's wonderful fun and it's, it's just what photography should be, community photography, mostly overlooked within photography. It's almost like, you know, if you, can, if you can't teach or whatever it is, and like, no, I'm sorry, but like, you've got to teach first. It's sort of like you know, putting wonder to others matters. It's in Bristol. Bristol's where Humphrey Davy and Thomas Wedgwood invented photography in 1803. Uh, look it up. And there's Humphrey Davy on the left with one of my beer can cameras. Good man. Um, and this is the sort of stuff we do. We do sort of build little camera obscures that kids can take away with them out of cereal boxes. We paste stuff on walls. And uh, that's Ruth, one of the directors. And recently we've been getting an alternative photography like these. Um, this is the earliest image of a handprint. It's 40,000 years old, and it just looks so much like the turmeric pictures. 40,000 years old, somebody copying stuff. This is using turmeric and uh, spinning it round on a drill and just sort of experimenting with borders and playing. It's daylight photography, and whilst dark rooms have been closed, we've been doing this stuff out in the daylight, which has been wonderful fun. This is COVID stuff. On the left, me teaching Rosa maths in lockdown. Oh, that was fun. And on the right, some flowers and stuff picked from my mum's grave, and we went and sort of made a picture out of them and stuff. And this is also other experimental stuff, so using Luma, getting photographic paper and soaking it and then putting it in cameras and doing images on wet paper and uh, just seeing what sort of madness you can get with spooky looking dolls um, and most recently what I did just before I came out here was we had to do some lumen prints and that means leaving it for about 45 minutes in the sun and luckily it was sunny and uh, so what you do is you do your pictures and then you play lawn bowls for an hour and then you go back to your photography and you could do this with anything because there's this hours gap it's rather like chess boxing or whatever you can mix alternative photography or experimental photography with anything else that takes an hour you know you could have counting to 60 60 times um or something but or have a game or learn some new skill whilst waiting for sunlight to do its stuff um and last but not least i'm going to just basically dedicate this to greg kemp who died about 12 years ago 10 years ago but he basically infused people and i did luckily i met him and stuff and uh he was such a positive sort of lovely guy that like the least we can do is remember you know the shoulders that we're all on and stuff so that's me
and I'm not sure what we do now. No, do I go. Play musical chairs. Go. Go. No, sit right next to me, Justin. Go past you then. It's confusing. Can I just mention that the three of us are in, and actually Justin managed to do it in the time. That Diane, just press the, press the press the push button. Oh, press the push button. Okay, just so you know, each one of us is doing a talk, and then at the end we're open to. Am I not pushing the right thing? Oh, okay, now I am. <laughs> Hello, Barcelona. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, yes, so Justin just did his, Heather's going to do her, we're, and I'll do one, and then we've got some questions for each other, and if you have questions from the audience, I, I think at first they thought maybe we wouldn't be getting questions from the audience. I don't know why that would be a problem during COVID. I, we can all talk still. So, just so you know what the format is, so. I'm going to press the push button again. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. my roadie. I would love to be your roadie. Um, and thank you so much, Justin. I've, it was great to see more of your work. I haven't seen everything you presented about. I know. Um, and the one thing I love about pinhole photography, because uh, you'll notice that Justin's work is so different than my work that I'm about to present. Um, we are, the three of us and any other pinhole photographer here, we're using the simplest camera there ever was. And the complexity and variety of outcomes that you can have with this simple camera is just astounding to me. And you like revealed that to me even more through your presentation. Um, so I'm gonna present about my work. Um, I am Heather Palasek. Um, I'm a fine art photographer. I work in pinhole, obviously, but also lumen print and cyanotype, as well as mixed media. Um, I'm a high school photography teacher where I live in New Jersey, USA. And I have a commercial photography business for the last 10 years as well. I would describe myself in the context of being an artist as someone who has always loved nature, science, and math. Um, I have a left brain, I think in a really logical way. I'm a tinkerer, I love to work with my hands. Um, I'm an experimenter. And all of these traits have contributed to my approach as an artist um, and how I make my artwork over the years. And it's definitely why I fell in love with film photography from such a young age. I took my first photography class at age 16 and have been obsessed with photography ever since and then went to art school to continue my education. Um, this slide actually doesn't have any pinhole photography in it, but I made this collage and wanted to show you some of my work to um, share a little bit more about me that most of my artwork and subjects have always involved nature. My techniques and approaches are varied and the majority of my concepts are based around um, the relationship that I myself or humans in general have with mother nature. So whether that's like a portrait series of trees, talking about my kinship with the forest, like activism work um, and work about climate change, that's what you're seeing here. Um, all of this work is considered photography, but not all of it was created with a camera. Instead, I like to create um, my art with photo materials, like chemistry, papers, and light. And it's not that I'm anti-camera, um, I just love the magic that can happen outside of the realm of a traditional photography. Um, my favorite type of photography is obviously pinhole photography, which I would consider outside of the realm of traditional photography. And one of the reasons is because of the magic that is present within uh, pinhole photography itself and in the process. Um, so for me, pinhole photography is about breaking down the barrier between you and your subject matter. Um, it allows me to experience what is happening in front of me um, at the same time that my camera is uh, experiencing it and creating its exposure uh, through capturing reflected light. It's slow. It requires you um, to use very long exposure times. And that is also a reason why it allows you to be present in the moment, something that is important to me. Um, you can't achieve this with the digital camera glued to the front of your face with all of the buttons and things to think about. Um, the simplicity of the camera is what allows that to happen. Um, it's simple build, 
also creates an aesthetic that I think all pinhole photographers really enjoy. This aesthetic um, of like perfect imperfections, really crazy depth of field and movement that just can't be matched with any other um, type of camera. And then I have at the bottom that, and it's cool, but I would also say fun. And I think you really see that in Justin's work, that pinhole photography is something that's just really cool and really fun, um, something that we really enjoy. So um, I started pinhole photography in college Although I was never taught it, I kind of taught myself and purchased a four by five like wooden pinhole camera from b &H. I didn't really know what it was. Um, I created my senior thesis project with it. And these are not those images. They were nothing really to write home about. But later on, I used that camera on vacations. Um, and I took it with me using paper and four by five negatives. And I discovered that the quality of the magical images that it created mimicked how it felt for me to experience the new places and cultures I was traveling in. That realization um, solidified for me the fact that a pinhole camera would be my ultimate travel camera and was something um, was like the start of the beginning of me discovering how I could incorporate the aesthetic of pinhole photography into my work about humans' relationship to Mother Nature. Um, and how to start synthesizing that aesthetic with my concepts. Um, I've since purchased um, on-do cameras, and that's typically what I use now, which is what these were taken with, as well as these. These are all um, 35 millimeter and 120 film photos taken in pinhole cameras. And then eventually, in 2017, um, my friend Nicole Croy, introduced me to solar graphy, um, which is an alternative way to use a pinhole camera with darkroom photo paper as your medium to create extremely long exposures that have the ability to capture the sun in the sky. Um, when she taught it to me, I'm really glad that I had the foresight not to ask her too many questions and instead jumped headfirst into it to discover the process for myself. At first, it was all about the adventure um, and the hands-on aspect of it. I was already passionate about hiking in nature, and now I found a way that I could create art while on my adventures by looking for locations to hang cameras in the woods. I would use a compass. You have to mark them on a map. Then you leave your cameras up. Justin talked briefly about solar graphy. You um, leave them up for weeks, months, or years, um, and then it's kind of like a scavenger hunt when you go back to retrieve those cameras. You have to find them. I love the aspect of discovery, of like exploration. Um, it was kind of like a performance art. But more deeply, this process um, was jarringly different than any way I had ever made art before. And I was hooked on that experience. It completely changed my mindset as an artist and taught me a lot about experimenting um, and also a lot about patience. When I was first doing this though, um, I had so much fun with the cameras and putting them up and then rediscovering them that it took me a full year before I even thought about subject matter. And I'm embarrassed to admit that. I was just so obsessed with the process. Um, this image was, I made, it's a year long exposure. And when I processed it, I noticed the tree in the foreground. And it was the first time that I was like, oh, this isn't just like fun and cool and like sciency, but this is a camera, like duh, like I should be focusing on my subject matter and not just capturing the sun. Um, so this image was like a light bulb moment for me, like duh, like you're so obsessed, um, like start figuring out how can I use this process um, in conceptual works. I didn't completely abandon the fun aspect of it though. Um, these are some that, you know, I still just put cameras up for the fun of it. Um, they don't have any concepts. These are just some recent ones I've made within the last year. Um, but I did eventually find a way to incorporate um, this process into a variety of series. Um, so I'm gonna talk about solar journaling, collaborating with Mother Nature, um, a houseplant series, and my community garden project. But I also have like a spooky series that I do every October. I uh, leave cameras up in graveyards. My movement series, which many of you have seen me walking around the festival. 
my tote bag with a camera on it. So when I'm on vacation, I usually tape a camera to the roof of my car as I'm driving. Um, but since this is a walking tour through Europe, I'm kind of traveling with it. So my movement series um, and then creating more like dreamlike landscapes. Um, but I'll start with solar journaling, which is me capturing the sun on very specific, important days. Uh, these have to be pre-planned out. Um, like this one specifically is the summer solstice um, in June of 2020, so last year. Whereas this one is my brother's wedding day. So putting the camera up in the morning, capturing the sun throughout the day, taking it down the very next day. Um, these two, my best friend had a planned C-section when she gave birth to her first baby. So these are her baby's um, like birth solar graphs. These are the last few hours of my grandfather's life. I knew that he was going to pass away and I put the camera. Um, these two are vacation photos. So not only do I tape a camera to the roof of my car and drive around, um, but I'll put one up like in a hotel room or wherever I'm staying and capture the sun through the duration of the trip. So the one on the left was a five day trip to Maine. The one on the right was a four day trip to Florida to visit my mom. Um, another series that I'm continuously working with is something I call it collaborating with Mother Nature. Solar graphy has given me a way to um, not just make art about her and my relationship with her, but to actually collaborate with her to make art. So I intentionally uh, do not seal my cameras properly or add specific things into the cameras themselves uh, that allow weather patterns, um, sun, humidity, rain, snow, uh, humidity, anything like that to affect the paper itself. So I, of course, choose the subject matter, um, but Mother Nature creates the final image. These are much more experimental. I never know what will happen. Um, sometimes there's rust or mold or the emotion peels. So this is my uh, collaboration series, which is ongoing. Some of these are intentionally collaborated and I will admit that some of them, it was like, oh, this is kind of a mistake. Like I, I didn't think the paper would get so ruined, but it did. Um, and I really accept and embrace uh, that they didn't turn out as planned. And then a few years ago, because I am obsessed with plants, um, I have house plants, like a jungle in my home. Um, I started putting cameras inside of the pots, uh, looking out the window. And I noticed in this image specifically that you could see the growth of the leaves, especially the one in the foreground. So that made me want to capture the growth of my house plants, and I continued to do so. Um, and then I would also put them in, like this one is my sister-in-law's house, so sometimes I would put them in other people's houses as well. But these are in my house. This is in my home. Um, these are a little bit more abstract. And this one again. And then this project um, transformed into something much larger. Um, in January 2020, I started capturing the growth of plants in the community garden near my home um, in Trenton, New Jersey. And through this project, I wanted to celebrate the growth of plants as well as their resiliency, which I find plants to be very inspiring. So I was putting plants up in the garden. Um, at first, in the year 2020, that summer, I was putting a camera up in May and I wanted to take it down in September. So I would capture the growth of the entire uh, growing season where I'm from. Um, that's like the growing season for gardens. Uh, and these two images, you can see like a lot of blurriness in the foreground, which is the movement of the plants. I noticed um, at the end of the year, or the end, like in September of that year, that they were a little bit too abstract. Um, you couldn't see the growth as much as I had intended. So this year, I did the same project again, but I found a way to make the growth more visible. 
Um, and the way that I chose to do that, yeah, Machi has got his thumbs up, he loves this image. Um, I, the way that I discovered to do this is instead of having a four month exposure, instead I should have like a one week exposure um, and also get much closer to the plants. So my, uh, my process is evolving a little bit to help out my concepts. Um, and this is a photograph of asparagus growing in the garden. This is lettuce growing in the garden. These are um, three separate week-long exposures, um, one after the other. So you can see in the first image, the lettuce is very small. And then the middle image is a little bit bigger. And in the third image, it's in the sky. It's, it's grown exponentially. Here are the same thing. You can see like ghostly images um, of the plants as they're growing. And this project um, will be ongoing. So I plan to continue this next year as well. So um, this is the last project that I'll be presenting about. I don't want to take up all of our time about pinhole photography talking about myself. Um, but I am so happy that you are here um, to be with Diane, Justin, and I. Um, I hope you enjoyed my work. And I'm curious to see what questions and answers we'll have later. Um, but Diane, I'll play musical chairs with you. Okay. Did you turn it off? No, got it done. Um, yeah, just great to, to see you and, and the people out there who are watching via the interwebs. And thanks to the whole EXP21 crowd because uh, it's uh, so, so freaking difficult to do during a, a pandemic. Uh, it's been super tough, um, I think for the organizers and for people taking the program and for us teaching, but I think we're all, we're all together in the same boat. So um, again, thanks for being understanding. So um, I was, I've got a little bit of intro of Justin. They, they asked to have uh, us to do a little bit of history of uh, Pinhole and Justin already has some. I just, I thought I'd get the Leonardo quote in there. You had Aristotle. Um, so again, this the idea of how pinhole photography works in terms of projecting an image into dark spaces has been understood for a long time. Actually, I have a theory that there, we will discover a cave art someday where all the animals are upside down, and that'll prove that uh, you know they had a, a hide in front of the cave entrance with a spear hole in it, and they were watching everything projecting inside. And there is actually no reason why they didn't you know, see that, that, that light in that way. And a lot of people when uh, I'm teaching and first talking about pinhole photography don't realize that our, you know, our eyes are pinhole cameras as well, but we've got two of them. You know, the light comes into our eyes through those holes, shines on the macula, our brain turns, flips it around, and because we have two eyes, we see in stereo. Um, but uh, it's just, it, I think anyone that does photography, it's, it's really terrific if you understand the principle behind light and how it works. Um, Cause it's, I mean, I just find it totally fascinating. So um, here's another illustration from the 1600s of, uh, you know, just when they were playing with it. What happened? Did I do the wrong thing? Oh. Is that, oh, the cable came out. I don't think so. That's weird. And I just control it with the arrows, right? I didn't, okay. Yeah, so there's lots of um, uh, illustrations from the past on, on different people experimenting with it. Maybe at the time they were more science oriented than artists, but uh, you know, right away people saw that there were ways of using these projections in terms of assisting with their drawing. And that's why you know, Da Vinci looked at it and there's you know, a whole theory that Caravaggio used it to draw and uh, certainly Vermeer, and that, you know, look up David Hockney's film where he talks about it, but before David Hockney, a lot of people understood the principle of light and how um, images would project from the outside. So for myself, I went to university, I'm Canadian, um, but I live part-time in France and in Canada. Um, 
And the same as what Heather's saying, and I think all of us that are interested in photography, we're always a little bit of a scientist and a little bit of an artist, and that combination of that kind of technology and observation and so on um, is, it, you know, we're really interested in that, and that adds to our, our, uh, our work. Um, but when I was in art school, I actually majored in sculpture and painting, did not like photography because I wasn't taught how to make a pinhole camera, and I hated that kind of tyranny of the manufactured object. In that point, it was everybody was using 35 millimeter cameras, so you were stuck with a certain format and certain films and certain ISOs. And it was the era of, you know, their documentary photography was taught. So it was the, the idea of the decisive moment as well, which I thought, all right, I'm not frozen in space and time, I'm moving through it. Um, I'd prefer something that kind of, that I could control the shape of and the kind of image making. So after I graduated, I actually uh, had seen someone making a pinhole camera and I thought it was a sculpture. I was doing sculpture in boxes and creating landscapes in the boxes with objects. And I realized that the same box shape that I was using, if I poked a hole in it, the landscape would go into the box and produce an image. So again, the same, I'm in the era of Justin where we, you know, this is very pre-internet. We were, I think there was a book I got called The Whole Thing, uh, which was one of the few publications and Eric Renner and um, Nancy in the States had this thing called the Pinhole Journal and uh, wrote away for information and so on. Anyways, my first image turned out and I'll tell you if it hadn't have, I probably wouldn't be sitting here today because I'd probably still be making sculpture. Um, because I, you know, like everybody wants instant gratification. So, um, you know, in the workshops, it's always rare if you get someone that an image turns out right away. So the fact that I got this, it was a guest at the time, it was about 12 minutes, it was foggy, there was light moving, um, I screwed up making the contact print, there's bubbles on it, and I just fell in love with the product. The very first image, my hair stood on end, and I just went, this is what I want to do. I just connected with the the technology or lack of technology. Um, so, but I just always, I throw this in because then for 10 years I was doing music. Um, I was still making pinhole cameras, but I got uh, very sidetracked with uh, pop music, new wave music of the 80s. Um, and then I got over that in 1990. So there's this jump, but in that time period I was experimenting with different kinds of cameras. So this one was just a little cardboard box recycled material, four by five. It wasn't, it was pre them having manufactured ones that you could buy with that. And um, I took it on a trip to France in, in 1990. And this is one of the first pictures I took uh, right across from the concierge. There was traffic coming down the road. You just see the headlights. Of course, you know, all the boats disappear in the river. And I just went, oh man, this is, this is like a drawing. It's like a charcoal drawing of that. It, and someone said, you know, it's more, your me it's more of a memory of the place than actual documentation. And I love that because it is, because it's this passage of time. And it was also a lot like music for me. I, I, I always wrote music based on a, a place that I was in. And because these took about the same length of time as a pop song, they were like three and a half minute exposures. I always thought of them as being little songs. Um, the next year, um, I actually tried to take this photo that year, 1990, but it, again, because there were bomb threats and stuff, I had this little box and you were always sort of avoiding the police, you know, and bomb squads taking things away. So what I was interested in was photographing the same things that everybody else was photographing with their regular cameras. But because we're used to those scenes, and there's probably a thousand people that took this image, you know, in the last hour, um, it was just interesting to see what happened using this kind of primitive technology. All the people in the street disappear. There was this really dark cloud coming. It was, it was kind of eerie. There's a lack of detail, which I like, because again, your brain can fill it in. It's almost scarier because you can't see that it's made of stone, right? And this image got used. I, it was with one of the stock photo companies. Um, I made more money from this. I always say I bought a house in France just because of this photo. It got used by UPS for marketing, got used on book covers. Yet it's, it was a found, like a, it was like David and Goliath, right? I had the slingshot camera and I didn't have the big club. And, but photo directors and stuff didn't know I had a pin camera. They just felt, 
this is different than most shots of this thing, you know? So again, it's just the kind of working with the things that it doesn't do right are the things that I, I, I like. So again, visited all these tourist areas and kind of re and photographed them just to see, you know, kind of compare them to, you know, like the one of Chichen Itza on the bottom that, that had like, hundred people, you know, in their bright outfits and they're, you know, wearing Mexican hats and stuff. And it was great. They, they all disappeared. Like everybody, the only time people showed up were on, you know, like on the beach and sieges um, because, you know, you sit still, you know. And then I have to use my joke about pinhole, pinhole paparazzi, you know, that's uh, not a great business to get into. I started doing this series of jet wings where I just held the box camera against the window of an airplane. Now this is before 9-11, so people weren't quite as nervous about you having something suspicious looking on a plane and looking at your stopwatch while you're photographing them. But these, these were really just that interesting aura, that kind of vignetting that you get with pinhole, especially through a plane window, and of these wings in flight. Um, I ended up making these as big banners for an aviation museum. Um, in 2000, I went to, um, I was invited on an expedition into the mountain, the Rocky Mountains. So I live now in Calgary, uh, Alberta. And I hadn't really done anything in color. I was really happy with black and white for, you know, 20 years. <laughs> and uh, I got the Zero camera, which I, I've been using here. And it was a, one that this, this guy made for the year 2000 out of Hong Kong. It fit 120 film. And I started doing some stuff in the landscape there and loved it, like that little berry on the bush, that thing is probably only, you know, two inches high. And again, super long exposures, this thing sitting on the moss in the forest, but, um, you know, it was a real switch for my work because I also could print the photos myself using uh, the facilities at the Banff Center. This is another one called Lone Tree. If you're Canadian, there's a group of artists called the Group of Seven who are very famous from, you know, over 100 years ago of doing landscapes in Canada that look like this. And uh, again, this depth of field thing is really wonderful. That tree is like a bonsai tree. It's probably only 16 inches high, but I had the camera right in front of it. And you, you, know, you end up feeling like it's this big, mighty you know, fir tree, but in fact, um, it's this tiny tree. And it's kind of illuminated because I had a yellow slicker, a jacket on, because uh, it was raining, and it reflected the light in the tree. And that little fog there is from my hand coming in to actually change the, uh, the, to open and close the shutter. I love things that move, like just I started playing with, you know, like water is fantastic. It just looks like weird, you know, icing or foam. And so these, these uh, areas of you know, looking at water and waterfalls, and I noticed that all of us have photographed has a really interesting texture to it. Um, this is a, a lake in uh, Banff Park, again, near where I live in uh, the Rockies, that freezes over and it's absolutely clear, about two feet deep with bubbles in it. It's almost terrifying to go across because it really feels like you could fall through, but it's very, very thick ice. So I love that some of the stuff, like the, you know, you get these reflections off the metal of the pinhole and you get these rainbow effects. So sometimes it's interesting to shoot into the light. In 2000, um, I guess it was 2003, I got a house in France and started photographing in some of these old houses. And I love rooms like this, because the rooms are, you know, camera obscura, dark room. And the, the rooms are like cameras with light coming in through these windows and so on. So again, it's just a series that I did, uh, Versailles, quite famous. This one of Versailles' ghost, I was annoyed. I had the camera sitting next to me on the bench, because again, you don't hand hold it, right? To keep, if it's three minutes long, if you hand hold it, you're gonna get, which is fine, like with your concept of walking around with it, then it's a whole different thing. But this person sat next to me and I went, oh damn, it's gonna wreck the shot. And then they got up, but I loved it because I ended up with this great kind of motion of a ghost. And again, this, you know, just the simpler these interiors were, the better. This is just, uh, almost looks like a stage set for some, you know, Beckett play or something. Um, again, these are, uh, these black and white ones I print myself in the dark room and some of them are, well, it's like I've got it there, a hundred centimeters big, so it's, they're really hard to print. Um, when it says 40 by 40, that's inches. 
And again, the water movement, there was a flood in Paris and the way the water moved through, I, I loved that with the branches of the tree. This is funny because you had the horse one. In this one, the horse moved towards me as well. And it's just its bum you see on the back there. And then if you look at the negative, you actually see there's a baby horse, right? You can almost see through its body. So it moved towards me. So there's that surprise, that unexpected stuff that's going to happen while you're, this exposure is happening. So sometimes you don't know, you know what's going to happen around you as you've set up the shot. And uh, often with these ones, it wasn't until a month or two later that I actually developed them and got to see the image. So that instant gratification that every, you know, like I have these cameras that are made out of boxes and people still look at the back of it thinking they're going to see the image. But uh, I mean, one of the things I should mention is we do all this and we have no viewfinders, right? I mean, we're not looking and setting up the shot. We, you get to understand your camera. If you use it for years and years, somebody, people go, how do you know the point of view? And how do you know the exposure time? And when we were sitting there, it's like, I feel it, you know, and it's, it's kind of neat to, to work that way. This one's funny because see the feet on the, you can see the time frame because there's these little feet walking away that are dark at the, right underneath where that couple are sitting. I always think they're on the edge of the world right there. Um, this is a series I did with, and I recorded sound at the location. So there's a, a book available that has the images, but you can hear the audio of what was happening while that photograph. So I started the sound recording at the same time as I started the uh, image exposure. So in this case, it's beautiful. You hear people with the baby buggy, the kid crying, he wants chips. There's a guy playing harmonica on the bench. There's birds, but it's, I had this installed in a public place with the sound playing on the, on the uh, they could hear. And it, I didn't even think of the cleaning staff at night when it was, you know, nobody was there and they hear these like people walking and talking and it was uh, an interesting thing. Again, this was part of the Sans et Lumière series. So carousels I love, again, because of the movement. Stampede Midway, this is on right now in Calgary. They're doing it despite COVID. So we're going to have all these COVID cowboys. Um, and that was handheld. And it's so apocalyptic. It was the sun was fantastic, but it was uh, when I was. And then I started experimenting. I, I, like, I, I was still interested in the object as a sculpture. So I wanted, and I was interested in astronomy. And it was funny, you were talking about astronomy too, Justin, is this idea of doing multiple. Um, I actually poked a hole for every star on the star chart. And if the star was bright, I did a big hole. If the star wasn't bright, it was a smaller hole. And I got images like this. This is a section of the Milky Way by candlelight. Um, and so there was only one candle in front of me, but like 500 holes. And it's a real star chart that I used. And um, each candle has got a slightly different view, point of view, depending on where the candle uh, where the hole was. So if the hole was up here, and some of the metal plates I use are this big, you're looking down into the candle, and here you're looking up, up at the side of it. So, and this whole series, I just looked at sources of light. So this is a 100 watt light bulb, but the Galaxy NGC 4565 is like a real galaxy. This is E equals MC square as M51 Whirlpool Galaxy. So if you actually zoom in on that, you'll see the text is e, e equals mc square, which was taken off a chalkboard on a movie about with Albert Einstein. And this is a, a funny one, self-portrait as a globular cluster. So globular cluster is a very early star formation. Um, it's not really pretty like a spiral galaxy. It's basically a blob. So I thought if I do a self-portrait as a star, I may as well pick something that doesn't sound like I've got a giant ego. So globular cluster just sounded kind of yicky. And so um, I was on TV talking about making these cameras. And I taped the TV show, froze the image on the TV when I got home. It took a lot of experimenting. It, I had to make the room completely black, because anything that was, would show up would show up on, on this, like a lamp. If it was on, you would see me on TV and a lamp 100 times. So I had to really isolate the image, but that's one's kind of fun. And then I love the way that looked, like when you're looking at the image on, um, on the screen, when I'm actually making the image um, and seeing what it's going to project, I thought, I just want to create these devices that people can walk into and see this thing. So I got back to making sculptures. So this is Garden Shed Galactica, 
one of the first ones. And again, I did panels where the doors and windows were, put pinholes in, and this, in the pattern of the night of the stars that you would see if you looked that way. So I was following that. And then I made these projection two screens on it so you could go in and see it projected on it. And there's just an example of, of the kind of detail. I mean, I just drilled the holes with a drill, so they weren't really, really perfect. So you had very, very soft images. But people were, would go in, and it's the same. You did one with the multiple images, too. And they're going, you know, how is this happening? What are you using? Are these little cameras in there? And it's like, no. Then I did one up north um, as part of this Midnight Sun Camera Obscura Festival. And this is up in Dawson, where on June 21st, it's 24 hours of daylight. There's no, it, the sun doesn't set. So I actually made this night sky or the pattern in the in the roof of the tent. I had the whole tent built in black. <laughs> it gets really hot, and um, so it was. You could actually see the stars, which you would never normally be able to see. And then I did this other stuff with um, it shining on a table, and uh, there's a whole, there's another component to it that I don't want to get into. But Dawson is known for the gold rush, so part of it. I had put gold nuggets all over, fake ones, that when the light at the, on the solstice would illuminate these gold nuggets. So it was kind of like Raiders of the Lost Ark or something, right? You go in and bing, it happens. I think I must be running out of time here. There we go. Um, and you could also hold up these little viewing screens and see the images projected from outside. So it had like all these different components into the tent. So I've gotten into that. This is another installation I just did recently. And this one, I actually put lenses in. And uh, these are the projections that you see inside. I flipped this one around. This is my, is hairy 100 times. So, um, and the book cameras. And we did a workshop here. So I won't talk too much about them because I see some of the people that were in my class here. Uh, but again, making things out of found objects and doing things related to that, that object. So, if it was a book about, and this is an exhibition to give you a sense of the scale of some of these things. So I showed the book and the images and some of the images I, bl uh, I blew up um, actually digitally for this one, this show. And then the last thing, I, one of the big projects I was working on was this World War I project looking at um, battlefields um, in the north of France and um, in Belgium 100, 100 years after the beginning of World War I. I got the idea in 2003 to do this project in 2014. So again, some of these projects take a long time, once you think of them, take a long time to complete. So um, anyways, this was when I was there at Vimy Ridge, I went, man, there are so many ghosts here, like the thousands of people that were killed uh, in the world, you know, World War I and whose bodies were never found. And I thought, you know, pinhole photography creates ghosts all the time. And I kind of just had this weird feeling about going to a place that's obviously has that history. Um, and you know, what would I see there? So um, this is one of the monuments. So that's the early stuff. So the show was big. There was a lot of images. It opened in Paris at the Canadian Cultural Center. And um, again, some of this stuff you can see on my, uh, on my website. But in, I had the camera on the ground looking up into the sky. Um, because a lot of, you know, I, I actually fell while I was there on my back and had this horrible feeling when I was looking up at how many people had died in that spot and what was the last thing they saw. Was it at night? Did you see the stars? Did you see clouds moving by? And so I was, you know, it was a real challenge to do something poetic and meaningful without using old images. And at first I was going to do in black and white because I thought that's the obvious thing. And it was weird. As soon as I photographed it in color, I went, no, it's got to be in color. Um, the show is called The Sleeping Green. Um, and it's from a poem by Isaac Rosenberg, who died in World War I but was a poet. And he talks about the fields uh, during the war being these muddy, you know, horrible no man's land and how it was the sleeping green. Someday it would be green again. And I thought, I'm going to finish this project like for what he said. And so I, um, I photographed there. So again, poppies are the you know people associate with. And it's because of a poem a Canadian soldier there wrote about Flanders Fields, where the poppies grow. Um, again, the trenches that are there. Um, 
you know, doing some of this darkroom stuff, that's not actually a pinhole photograph. That's what I, uh, I used a 120 roll, uh, rolly cord camera, but it was where a gas attack happened. So it's some of the darkroom stuff that I did. This one is a pinhole one, but I did stuff in the darkroom to make it appear as though this tunnel or this hole in the ground. Um, again, this is over a cemetery. This is a, one of the German cemeteries, and I had the uh, camera facing up through the trees, and it just um, and then I covered the photo. I started just covering it with rocks while I was uh, exposing it in the dark room, and so it's like these things falling from the sky. Um, the pool of peace, you know, it's they put I put ball bearings on the photo. They'd roll all over the place, but the bombs were full of ball bearings. So um, again, this I'm just going to go through, and this is my latest series which is looking at um, biodiversity gardens and gardens and using some of these same techniques of incorporating photograms in the dark room with the images that I do. So I think I'm gonna just end, here's a nice Canadian shot that I'm gonna end with called understory and it's kind of looking at plants and incorporating the plants on top of the images that I'm doing. So I'm sorry if I went, you needed the big stick to hit me with. No, I know, but like, Yeah, we were gonna. I'll, I'll, I'll never, no, keep going. <laughs> no, I, that's, uh, no, I'm, fi I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm done, so that's, uh, good, well, see, we're at the hour mark, which is what we wanted, and then we got a, we've got time for questions, I don't know, do you want, do people have questions, we have, we have some stuff we, I want to take a picture of the audience, actually, oh, that's a good idea, yeah, all right, there we go, I should do it with my pinhole camera, yeah, you've got to keep still for six months, how many people out here, put up your hand if you are, have done pinhole photography. I know that, I, I know some. Oh, good. Well, well, that's good. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, 30 years ago, you would have been laughed at, like we were. Um, yeah, press the, Heather knows how to One, do it. One, two, three. Oh, cool. All right. Yeah, I agree. But, and we're just, I mean, one of the questions I think we were talking about online was, um, why, why is pinhole and, you know, this, this other kind of experimental photography popular now? Like, you know, I mean, probably you have different answers to that, but it, there, you know, I wish I had have made a book several years ago, except Justin invited me, my, some of my images into his book, so that's, that's how I... Yeah, made millions of pounds and didn't give you a penny. We got, I, I, I don't think I've seen any money. No, that. strange that, isn't it? Oh, well. <laughs> um, is there any particular questions about this? Um, I mean, by any means, because I know there are some cool photographers here and stuff. Um, if it's not necessarily questions, just something that sort of like, you know, you want to throw out there because pinhole oh, photography. Question, yeah, a question about what we've done or why. Or, you know, so. what we want to drink, something like that, you know, and we're happy. But any question anywhere? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just a little curious because, I mean, I've worked with a lot of different pinholes, uh, but my usual barrier for going out and doing a lot of it is um, like when working with uh, darkroom paper, for instance, it, do you typically take like a change bag with you or what, what sort of are your approaches to storing images until you can, or um, paper until you can develop it? Can I? Yeah, yeah I think we all have different yeah. techniques. Okay, uh, I quite like, especially if I'm doing workshops outside with kids and stuff, I'd normally load up about 100 beer can cameras and put them in, beer, put them in black bags. Uh, the thing to do is to remember which ones have been exposed and which ones haven't when you've got sort of like 15 kids sort of like, you know, trying to ask you how to count up to 15 and things like that. But um, that works if you've got an idea of the exposures and stuff. I've, I used to use changing bags when I was using 10.8 film and stuff, but I find them such a drag with dust and stuff that like a, I just make loads of cameras on these. Um, I think you actually have a couple options. So I mentioned the first camera I ever worked with was a 4x5 like wooden camera. So with that, I used 4x5 film holders. So that was really easy. You can just flip them 
Um, or like Justin just said, if you are super motivated, you could have like a bag full of preloaded cameras, um, which works really well. He uses, it seems like maybe strictly beer cans. I typically use vintage, uh, like cookie tins, tea tins. They're all different shapes and sizes. So the shape and size of the camera dictates uh, what the photo will look like and how big the paper is, how distorted it will be if it has a curved background, a flat background or where I put the paper um, within the camera itself so it gives you more options but then you would need like another bag so when it's done exposing you stick it in there and it's kind of like silly because you'll be walking around the street and people are like what are you doing why do you have a bag full of tins and yeah I always thought people might use a black change bag with with some of those but you know you get it you know you've got this black bag on your lap and your hands are disappeared and you've got this far away look in your eyes <laughs> and you're sitting on a park bench and i think what are people thinking i'm doing you know it's you always try to go somewhere more secluded i mean some of the you know the early stuff i just took one photo a day and you know what there's something kind of liberating and really you know interesting about doing that and i actually tell my students sometimes limit the amount of photo like people take way too many photographs now you've probably got a billion on your phone you're never going to look at uh you know pinhole because of the amount of effort that goes into doing it you think a lot more about what you're going to photograph and um uh, and maybe are more are, you know more careful i mean i have done series where i just i got mixed up about which bag was you know now i fold over a corner when i expose it but then I just started double exposing everything. In fact, I ended up with some good stuff that you know was that were double exposures that ended up working out all right. But that um, you know you're just never going to be doing as many photos as as a, you know the digital era, and no one ever has made this many photos. You know, in the old day with film, film cost a lot, and you know it's you know people now basically your first expense is this, and then every picture is free really. And that's never been the case until this, you know, this century. It's pretty, pretty strange. So I, qu I quite like. I mean, the wheelie bin stuff. It's just you got one go, and you've got one day uh, to not mess it up and to sort of fend people off trying to throw their rubbish into your camera and things. You know, it's it's a one-off, and like that vulnerability. I usually say it's like. I find pinhole photography a bit like riding a unicycle. You've got to feel as if you're falling. You've got to get used to the not being in control. And the same with a lot of experimental photography. You've got to be in that zone, that lack of comfort, to actually start learning and stuff. You know, if you know what's going to happen, what's the point? And, you know, that, as you say, is what I do. With a lot of my stuff is to do with education. A lot of the stuff I end up taking and stuff is through sort of like when I'm working with others and stuff. But um, I quite like the sort of boxes of pinhole cameras and carting them out the place and, yeah, getting them mixed up. <laughs> sometimes I do workshops and, and you'll get people who are going, well, you know, how can I take more images and how can I get the image clearer? And I go, you can by just buying a regular camera, <laughs> you know? Like, it's very strange. Like, there's, the, there's a certain kind of person, and I'll say it's usually a guy. Um, but it's, you know, <laughs> it is, it's just like, they, you know, and I said, this, there's limitations to this and this is what you have to embrace. And I think, you know, what you said about being performance artists, and I feel like that a lot of times, like even the dark room with doing these, but even the whole process of making the images is, it's more than just taking a photo. It's, there's, yeah, there's, there's all this other stuff that happens, which, we obviously enjoy doing. <laughs> so. have a, any other? Yes, we, ha, we, ha, we have millions of people desperate to ask us awkward questions about heaven knows. Let's check. Uh, I have a question. If you know if there is a movie about, uh, about pinhole technique, I, I, I know there is a movie, One Day of Pinhole Photographer, and this is about this guy on the right. I saw the movie, yeah? But I mean, something like a historic, uh, some brief history of, 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 uh, of uh, pinhole uh, photography, not reportage about an artist, but treated as a, as a big project. Do you know if such a movie exists? There's, um, there's a thing called The Light Fantastic. I wrote, I, I did this, there's a series of television things in Bristol, and I went and sort of like, 
compiled them all for Green Umbrella. And there was a couple of, it was supposed to be an hour and hours program each. And there was a whole hour which was going to be pinhole. Um, anyway, they basically didn't do that. And about three years later, some other company went and did it, which pissed me off a bit. Um, so there's a thing called Light Fantastic. But you'll find a lot of the, being honest with you, there's a lot of people just copy other people's mistakes. I, there's, um, there's a few history of photography. Who's the Norwegian guy? John Grepstad, is it? Brilliant history. There's a few really good history of pinhole out there. Um, I don't think there's ever been a good film about it. There's what, been bits. What was the film you worked as a consultant on, though? That was a fictional Yeah, that was, film. That was Ryan Johnson's thing. That was a Brothers Bloom. That yeah. was good. But that was, uh, that was just a bit of pinhole. Um, there's not really been any, you know, it's a real shame. There's so, stuff. So, okay, let's make this movie, okay? Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm in, okay? okay? Okay, that's good. No, we'll do it. We'll do it. Each exposure can be six months. That'd be no, good. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I mean, just something to educate people how to deal with these images. What is the story, be, what, well, this, uh, history behind this? Mm. What's the clue of the technique and, and, and so on? Let's, l l I think about, uh, about such such movie for, uh, for a common audience. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Um, I found that most pinhole movies, um, like short clips on YouTube, I even show some of them to my students, they're mostly about the camera obscura and like how we discovered what the pinhole camera was and then it stops. Mm -hmm. And in conversations I've had with Diane, you've been doing pinhole photography much longer than I have. Mm -hmm. um, you told me that years ago when you started, like pinhole photography was kind of a joke. The art world didn't think no, it was yeah, art. It was yeah. like a, you're why are you playing it's with a this child? You know, it's a grade box. grade five physics project that you know if you had a yeah. good science teacher, he gave you a can and you know you made made one. Yeah, so it, I don't think anyone's made a video because for so long, panel photography really wasn't considered art in the photography. It, it wasn't photographers that took it on. It was like fine artists and stuff. Yeah. It's like Willie Ann Wright and and a few others really early on who went and actually sort of like you know worked with it. Um, but it wasn't photographers. Photographers are too busy polishing lenses and stuff, I suppose. I don't know. Again, well, like, bloke stuff. The, yeah, the story I was telling Heather was when in the 80s, so I'm applying for a grant to do pinhole photography, and the, the juries for the grants were photographers, but they were all documentary filmmakers, and they just laughed at my portfolio, right? I mean, those images I showed you, the, you know, and they just thought, you're just, these are blurry shots, and there's, you know, stuff on them, and and it was frustrating for like about 10 years and really it was the onset of digital photography that changed the way people thought about that but also when they changed the jury system so it was artists on the jury not photographers it could be a sculptor or a painter or whatever instantly i started getting grants so it was in, artists could see what i was trying to do but photographers couldn't which is you know, like in a way, they were my nemesis for you know about twenty years until you know things flipped around. So it's uh, they're still there. They <laughs> really are. I just I just fall out with people all the time because of uh, just saying the wrong thing. Uh, it's quite fun though. <laughs> yeah, it's it's we're doing something different. I mean, I don't even think you know. I mean, they can be you know they're in the history of photography, but I don't. It's just silly. It's apples and oranges. It's silly to compare them, really. They do two different things. So He's got a whole... <laughs> um, so first of all, I want to thank you uh, for the presentation and how and to say that I would always think about pinhole as one thing, just from like Google, you know, they like Google pinhole cameras or pinhole photography, and you see tuck, 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 the same image. And I was amazed how uh, uh, different and also deep each of your personal uh, explorations were, so thank you for that. Um, and I wanted to ask a question, uh, because I always, I always see uh, um, pinhole photographs as being like really wide angle, and I think that's also in common with, with the, the three of you. I never saw a narrow angle pinhole. So I'm asking myself, is that a limitation of the apparatus or of the technique, or did you ever try to do or achieve it? <laughs> Uh, the only way, you, it, it's the maths, it's the physics, is if you put a pinhole on the end of a tube, you know, the image won't be as detailed. It's just 
it's almost like you can do a wide angle picture and then to make it telephoto, just cut a small bit out of the film. The maths of it's a bit weird. There's a sort of, I do, I love wide angle. That's what I do. The wider it is, you know, you, get, you can do wide angle stuff. It's fairly sharp. You don't, you know, I, I'm not saying you want it sharp or anything. There's no rules with it. But telephoto pinhole doesn't really work. I had to do a book um, and one of the things they insisted was having a digital pinhole, which I've actually got a few interesting things out of. It's so weird. It's almost like it's horrible because it's not what you should do, putting a pinhole in a DSLR. But I'm slowly finding areas, because it's so horrible and because it so doesn't work, it annoys me because I know there's potential there. And I've recently seen a few things that have been absolutely gorgeous, done DSLR stuff, not just blurred photos and things. But I had to do, they said, right, you have to do digital pinhole. I said, I don't really want to. And they said, tough. And uh, also telephoto. So I wrote it, and it doesn't work, really. It's just getting lo more soft. However, others may think differently. What, one of the things with telephoto is the, the exposures are way longer, right? So I mean, I have one of those 4 by 5 boxes that are quite long. And there are some, like I'm thinking Robert Mann did some close-ups of uh, flower, but, but you know, you can do it, but the exposure time is super long. And uh, as you're saying, it kind of gets, gets more grainy. One of the things about digital SLRs, unless you have a really expensive camera, that the little thing that records the image is quite small. And what, when we're taking photos, we've basically got negatives this, this size at the small, you know, and bigger. So the digital SLR, you can put a pinhole on it, but if it's only going to hit this little, you know, the macula of the camera, it's, uh, it's quite small. So you're losing, you know, some of that wide angle. And it does, they do look terrible. I haven't seen many. There's a guy doing flowers, and I, I don't know if he's even here. And um, I started, I copied him. I, started, I suddenly thought, hang on. Yeah, go for it. I had done the sort of similar stuff before, but I did with a load of students at Falmouth recently. And they're, they're incredibly soft, they're incredibly unsharp, but they're all equally soft. And they're the sort of things that you could do massive posters off and they would look absolutely gorgeous. So, you know, you just ha there is a potential there, but it's not photography, it's painting with light and that's not what DSLRs are made for. Yeah. Yes, so yeah, my, my question is uh, referring like, I did some pinhole photography, but, but uh, with mirrorless digital. This is a mirrorless, yes. And I think that I get lots of uh, vignetting. And um, the pictures are not very saturated. I don't know if this is this, the thing for any digital photography with pinhole or whether this is uh, different from analog photography or whatever. So are you saying that when you, you made a pinhole for your mirrorless uh, digital camera and you're getting black vignetting, like a circular? Lots, lots of vignetting, yeah. Okay, so there's a math equation that you just have to figure out the distance between the hole and the plane that your um, image sensor is on. The size of the hole, depending on how far it has to travel, it will create a certain sized image. You just have to figure the math out a little bit better. Um, I don't know how you could research what specific digital camera you have, um, what the focal length is. I don't know if you made your own hole or not, but there is a math equation you can figure out to make it larger. There's a video on my website on making the best quality pinhole for DSLR. Yeah, and so it's a, a fifth of a millimeter would be as good as you can get. And, and it's so, aluminium. You can go to like mrpinhole.com. Is, is it dot net? The <laughs> which, which one? The thinness. It, the thing that affects the sharpness is not the size of the hole, yeah, although every, every book says it is. Every book says it's the size, yeah, but it isn't. It's the, in, the sharpness of the inside edge. It's almost like it has to be such a, like razor sharp on the inside is far less diffraction than if you have a thick. Making a pinhole out of card will always, you know, let's say one did it, you'll have a sort of almost a tube, but aluminium, which is sanded down, really thin and then sanded after the hole is done so the inside ed edge is sharp creates the sharpness there is a mathematical equation but with all due respect just a fifth of a millimeter for anything sort of like 
from that focal length with a smiley cam to about that is fine. Really bins more like a millimeter, but that's another world. So I, I can add like, uh, like, like an, uh, an extension to between the pinhole and the camera. Uh, that this, this will help not to have so much vignetting this way, I guess. This would help. Yeah, no, uh, no, I, I know about the diffraction. And of course, it, there's diffraction even on F11. So hmm. you know, with a pink hole, I guess that the effect must be even stronger, I guess, yes. And, but, the, but what about the, the saturation? Why, why I get like less saturated uh, pictures? Uh, can you give me like some advice? I would just have to see the camera. I'd just have to see the camera to know what was happening, yeah? There's so many variables. The reason I use beer can cameras and stuff, it's education again. The variables are so huge with pinhole photography. There's the size of the pinhole, pinhole to film plane distance, how bright it is, what the sensitivity of the uh, emulsion it is, um, you know, how long it takes for a kid to count up to 10. There's so many variables that like what I do with my beer can cameras is everyone has something exactly the same. It's not necessarily how I would use one to do the best quality image, but like when it comes to kids making their own, being in charge of it, you know, you want kids to go right the way through from the actually pushing a pin in, wondering what on earth am I doing, why am I doing this, to suddenly ending up with creating a picture and seeing it appear in developer is, you know, they own the whole process, they have created it. So everything is different with it. And the DSLR stuff's different. And that's what I think is so fantastic. There are no, there's no real answer. And books that, I've written books on how to do it and stuff. But at the end of the day, I'd suggest that people sort of uh, borrow it from a library. You don't buy it, just borrow them from libraries and then play and experiment and see what you get. It really is a, a sort of chuck it out there and hope, really. I have two questions. One is for Diane, the other one is for Justin. A technical question. For one is to, for Diane. Could you explain to me what what is this? How did you do this image? What is the size of camera? I keep looking at it and I admire it. Beautiful work. And uh, for Justin and his uh, garbage bin photograph is uh, always mesmerize me. How farther you can go. So when you create a European hall, are you using still a beer can plate? I don't think that you're using small pin needle to create a pinhole, I assume. So that's my question. How do you do this bigger project, big size of camera? Um, yeah, I guess. I just guess. But a pin, a pin, for wheelie bin stuff, it's about a millimeter, seems to work one millimeter size pinhole. But you, it, what I love about it is it's this massive tactile, physical, um, I mean, you know, taping it up after you've done the image, taping it above a sink, and then you're getting developer stop bar fixer, you're getting sponges of it, you're getting dermatitis all over your body. It's absolutely disgusting. Nobody can breathe, but it's great fun. It's really as Jackson Pollock, you know, these streaks appear and it's, it's physicality, and I think this is one of the things with pinhole photography and darkroom stuff and all the rest. You know, how much wonder is there in holding this device and going like that? It's like you, I've never downloaded an, a wonder. You can't download wonder, yeah? But the whole, you know, the, that whole physicality of it, holding, mm -hmm. touching, not screen-based stuff, but going in, the red darkroom, people go on about the smell. I don't have a sense of smell, mm -hmm. but like, all of that sort of like, that, that experience. And what I love about it is like, you know, we've had 500 kids who are between seven and 10 years old uh, in Bristol who have gone through the whole camera obscura sana type pinhole photography and not one of them will ever forget it uh, because of this whole environmental thing of seeing everything. And, you know, it's, it's you know, it, 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 there's nothing too harmful about it anyway. It, no, yeah. that's, that's true. And they don't forget. I mean, I've done things with young kids, and then 20 years later, you know, seen something in a magazine they're doing, and they will, you know, quote that experience that, that changed mm -hmm. the way they, like whether it was there was one kid doing this skateboard things much later on when he, you know, actually mastered the technique and did really, really interesting stuff. So. But yeah, to answer your question, this is the cam pinhole camera that I use. Yeah, the Zero. 
So um, again, there's a pinhole, and this takes 120 film, 6.6. Six. And um, so I shot a series in, in the forest of that. So the, I started with the pinhole negative, went into the dark room, and printed so on big you know, paper this, this size. And while I was exposing it to the light, I had leaves that I had collected and put on the print. So I, I broke the time up into intervals of about 10 seconds, let's say, to make that print would, in the dark room took 60 seconds. After 10 seconds, I put that one leaf on that's really white because it blocked the light then from hitting the paper. Then after another 10 seconds, I put another leaf on and arranged them. Again, it's all in total darkness. When you work in color, you can't even have a safe light, right? So it's it's really tricky. I mean, I've done it and completely missed the sheet of paper, and it's you know like I'm putting leaves on top of you know the uh, you know something at the side. So you have to um, again, it's like this performance thing. You you know you kind of get set up, and that's the same as the World War One images. I brought into the dark room rocks and different objects and lay them. So it's a two two step project. Like some people have said, this is Robert Mann said about the, you know, there's like one stage is the dark room and then it's like 50% or 50 is taking the photo and another 50% is what you do with it afterwards in terms of processing it or making the image. Because there's so, you know, in this case it's taking, for me it's brought it into another dimension to be able to do this stuff in the dark room. But that said, I'm now dependent on these color dark rooms which are really hard to find, like nobody, you know, everybody's doing stuff digitally now, color. I mean, it makes sense, it's way easier, but for me, I can't do this any other way. So it's, uh, I, I think it's, I keep thinking, you know, everybody was scared 20 years ago that there was gonna be no black and white film, it was the end of, you know, traditional photography. And I mean, it's good that events like this happen because, you know, and, and what, Ilford went under, Kodak went under, but then somebody buys Ilford and somebody buys Polaroid and they keep doing it. So as long as we keep making stuff with that, they'll be small, you know, they'll be more expensive and smaller, uh, you know, companies. But, you know, it's, mm -hmm. I think it's really important. You know, it's, it's, we're not gonna throw away pencils because we can do drawings on our computers, right? I mean, it's, I don't know. The pencil of light, didn't somebody famous say that? It was a, uh, Oh, yeah, probably. I think I was at, I think that was Fox, Fox Talbot, yeah. So, did that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Well, it's interesting, Justin's done the one where he puts the leaves in the box with, while well, he's taking the photo, so it's, yeah, so that works too, in a totally different way, yeah. Yeah. So we're doing good yeah, here. I think good. actually we're right right at the time to, to wrap it up. So um, thank you, EXP21. Let's hope that COVID's over by 22. Yeah. <laughs> God. Yeah, and I guess any of us, if you have, have any other questions, you know, I'm Diane Boss website dot ca though, or or we're all on uh, Instagram too. I think you just fire our names in and find us. But uh, no, good questions, and thank you so much for you know being here and, and great meeting you guys. Justin and I have known each other for many many years, and this is during this festival is the first time we've met in person, so it's kind of... Uh, We've been spit. trying to avoid each other yeah, for years. Yeah, we have been. And yeah. then, uh, Didn't, couldn't carry on. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> never mind. Yeah. All right. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you, people. <laughs>